the Just Hit budget memo, which was first uh, divulged to the media or obtained by the media last October, is a truly shocking document in my view because it basically proves that there was an internal policy within RBS of uh, serious abuse of business customers once they got into the global restructuring group, which is otherwise known as the abattoir or psychopath unit within RBS. This unit was formerly called Specialized Lending Services. So RBS was doing it before the crisis under that banner, but they then renamed it Global Restructuring Group in 2008. And they basically massacred tens of thousands of UK companies uh, through that unit. What well, the memo, the uh, Just Hit Budget memo seems to suggest is they were basically out to destroy. They were, they were setting out to deliberately destroy any company that came in there with a view to asset stripping and seizing its assets with absolutely no um, concern for the welfare of the owners of those businesses or whether or not the businesses were viable. I don't know if there's been a you know, formal edict from George Osborne or uh, his predecessor, Alistair Darling, uh, or their successor, Philip Hammond, who, as Chancellor, to cover up the GRG scandal. Um, but certainly, there is a lot of conflict of interest uh, within UK government. Because on the one hand, they own, um, I think it's 73% stake in RBS. It was, it was higher before as a result of the, the bailout which followed the bank's collapse. Um, so they want to try and eke as much value as they can out of those shares. Um, and so they, they have this kind of innate desire to perhaps suppress or minimize uh, scandals that happen within RBS, especially ones that they believe might be very costly for the company. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one thing. But on the other hand, you do have a, a, a series of MPs, including Norman Lamb, Clive Lewis, um, and you know, there's a whole host of them who you saw speaking today in the, in the House of Parliament, in the House of Commons, sorry, um, who have been badgered by constituents who have lost their companies, their livelihoods, in some cases their work, their spouses, in some cases their mental health, as a result of RBS's actions. So these MPs have been almost like gradually over the years been spurred into action. I think once there's a, 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 there's a mood of, of anger within the House of Commons, such as we saw today, it kind of galvanizes others to, 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 to take up the battle as well. So that there's been, I think that t today, it has been a bit of a sea change. You know, this, I've been to other debates or watched other debates about GRG in, in the House of Commons, but this was by far the most powerful. And you really felt that the government has no hiding place now, and, and the FCA has no hiding place to continue to, to try to minimize, bury, or um, suppress information about, about this, this, this scandal. I've long argued that the, the regulator, the FCA, is a captured regulator. It's far too close to the banking industry. And when George Osborne appointed um, John Griffith Jones, who was the ex-head of KPMG Europe, uh, whose, whose accountancy firm, by the way, had given a clean bill of health to numerous banks that failed, including HBOS, which was disastrous, and the Cooperative Bank and various others. Um, the very fact that George Osborne appointed John Griffiths Jones to run the new regulator, which was supposed to be this you know, new broom in the city that was going to be tougher than the FSA, we knew that, that, that it was going to be a joke because you can't have a serious regulator which actually believes in ensuring that wrongdoing is rooted out, that criminals within the financial system are prosecuted, and that companies and individuals who get fleeced by banks can obtain justice. If, they, if, they, if they're from that KPMG type background, because the KPMG type background entirely revolves around protecting institutions like big banks. That's the mindset of someone like John Griffiths Jones. But just to go back on the history, you had a body called the Financial Services Authority created by Gordon Brown in 1997. And that turned out to be an utterly useless regulator uh, and was disbanded in, uh, basically it was asleep at the wheel. It didn't even really have any, um, it, it did one or two good things, but overall it was a pretty useless regulator. Uh, and it was disbanded by the, the coalition government in April 2013, and it was replaced by this new thing, the Financial Conduct Authority, or FCA. But as I said, you know, with John Griffiths-Jones as chairman, 
the idea that that was going to be a regulator with teeth that was actually going to do the things I said, pursuing justice, rooting out wrongdoing, prosecuting criminals, white collar criminals, you know, one knew that it wasn't going to happen basically. An amerta is a mafia term um, which relates to a vow of silence. Um, if you're captured um, by the police or by your enemies, you don't spill the beans on who, who your colleagues are or what they've been up to within the organization, the mafia. And this very much applies to the banking sector. There's been an omerta. Well, I believe there is an omerta, and I experienced it when I was trying to research my book, uh, Shredded, to some extent, um, in that a lot of senior bankers, especially those which are still active in the industry, even if they move to a different institution, uh, don't want to tell you much about stuff that's happening within their industry. So it's a vow of silence, um, which many bankers seem to have signed it. I don't think there's an official one. I don't think they've actually signed it, you know, obviously. But it's a sort of culture of silence and a culture within the city and within the banking sector of uh, persecuting and vilifying whistleblowers, which is all part of the AMERTA. So if you, are, if you are a whistleblower who actually identifies wrongdoing and tries to um, alert the authorities um, or you know, tries to alert the media to the fact that there's been some wrongdoing within your institution, you're, you're, especially in this country, the UK, you're, you're, you're actually signing almost a death warrant because there's no real protection for whistleblowers. Um, you know, they, they will be ostracized by all their colleagues. They will never get a job back in that industry. And it's so different in the US. I mean, the US doesn't do everything proper, you know, perfectly, but in terms of the, the way they treat whistleblowers, it's like poles apart from the UK. They give them massive rewards. You know, the regulator gives them hundreds of millions of dollars in rewards and things. So, you know, the temp it's a totally different incentive structure for whistleblowers, and they are protected there as well. It's convenient for the FCA because you know it, it means they don't they're not perceived as having to be that thorough in terms of their investigations or in terms of their actions in terms of finding out what happened prosecuting the criminals and jailing the, the criminals uh, they uh, they you know they do have principles of business and they do have a banking code which uh, which which does apply right across a, a bank like RBS you know, even though it's technically an unregulated sector lending to small businesses, there is still a banking code and there's still principles of business which a bank is supposed to adhere to. And within GRG, RBS almost certainly broke every single rule in the banking code and almost certainly broke every single rule in the principles of business. So a lot of us were calling for inquiries way back in 2009, just after the crisis and in 2012 after the LIBOR scandal erupted in June 20, 2012. Um, those were more wide-ranging inquiries which would have covered all aspects of banker wrongdoing, including the role, the collusion with professional services firms like the accountancy firms, the lawyers, the chartered surveyors, insolvency practitioners, etc. So you, you would have, like, you'd open a whole can of worms, basically, which is what PCORA did in the US in 1933. Uh, the Pecora Commission under uh, F.D. Roosevelt did exactly that in, um, after the great crash of 28 in 33. Um, and, and I think that should definitely have happened. But now you could, yes, have a specific inquiry into banks' sh uh, shocking abuse of SMEs and small, small, small and medium-sized businesses. And I think that, that would be worth doing. I mean, there'd be nothing to be lost by doing that. It would at least make the public more aware of the shocking malpractice that is rife in the small business banking sector and in the, the professional services sector that, that buzz around that.